to worship with us. This song is what we got to do with everything we just prayed. We got to arise.
keep worshiping, keep worshiping. Thank you. 
is talking about. Saying a miracle can happen now because the Spirit of, of, of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around because we are the body. We are His children. We have to be that evidence. They say, where's the evidence of God? We have to be the evidence of God. In everyday lives, flowing in the love of Jesus to whoever we're talking about. And whether we're talking to a white man, a black man, Hispanic, Asian, it doesn't matter the nationality, it doesn't matter their past, it doesn't matter if they were the biggest crook that has ever lived. We have got to flow in the love of Jesus because God's Spirit is His love. It is His love. All of the greatest things that God and Jesus have ever done have been driven by compassion and love. When Jesus healed people, so many times it says He was moved with compassion, and so He healed that person. Or He was moved with compassion and cast that demon out of that person. If we want to be able to, it was so often sometimes we think, and it is the fire of God, but we get so built up in the fire of God that sometimes it almost, I feel like some, sometimes Christians almost move in like an anger. But it's the love of God that's going to bring us that power to cast out the devil, to, to heal the sick, to see those miracles happen. Because if we start flowing in that, other people, other Christians that might have previously operated in hate and anger towards people, they're going to want what we have. They're going to come to give whatever it is that you have. So I want us to say a miracle can happen now. I want us to sing it and really sing it to God. Sing it to Him. And really let the, the word sink in. And when we sing that overflow, speaking into existence, you're not just singing a song. When we are singing, the words we speak have power. It's more than just singing some words that sound in energy. We need to be speaking that He is overflowing in this place. That He is filling our hearts with His love. That His love is surrounding us. Because He is the reason we came here today. And if there is another reason... I don't know what it is, but he should be the reason that we're here today. Yes. Yes. So let's just let's sing a miracle in heaven now again. Let's sing it all to him and declare what we are what we are singing. You're the reason. 
here as in heaven. And it's, what, and it's coming from that, the Bible verse, the Lord's Prayer that we all know. And it says, you know, your will be done you know, on earth as it is in heaven. And that, there's, there's, there is no hate in heaven. There is no hate. Sometimes people try to take hate and justify it. Like you say, no, there's no hate in heaven. There won't be any anger. Heaven. Heaven will be a perfect place, and the, though the earth is not perfect, God's will is that we try to make our lives down here on earth, and that we try to make this earth like heaven. We may not succeed, but we can make sure that we are flowing in His will, which is that we operate how we would in heaven, always in love and peace and joy towards everyone, towards the oppressed and the oppressors the, the same. Because as much as my heart bleeds for the, the, the victims and the people that have been wounded and hurt and killed in Virginia, my heart should equally bleed and, and, and feel love and pain for the, the, the ones that are the aggressors, the ones that are doing it. Continuously declaring revival. Want to come in revival? 
Well, I don't see it, you say. By faith, we are in revival. We're speaking it. We're not begging for it anymore. We're in it. These nights of prayer has changed my life. I was here Thursday night, just me. I normally don't come, as I said, on Thursdays, but Malachi had a, a class at the library, and I thought, I'll open the well tonight. I told the rest of them, I'll do it. Y'all get tomorrow night. So I'm here, and uh, I'm just going to tell you the story, which sounds odd, but you're going to understand it when I get to 1 Kings chapter 21. I decided to go in there and pray at the little area we call the well. We used to have service over there when we first started. And I was praying in the well. And uh, I felt God deal with me strongly about some private things and things for the town. This will apply to all of you, even if you're not from Walnut Cove. In your personal life, what I'm going to say is going to apply to you. And I felt, I said, well, God, I, I feel like you're, you're going to give me a word in, uh, from the word, the written word, to back up some things you're telling me. And I felt him say, absolutely, I'm going to give you a word. And I said, I waited. Because these days, you, you know, when you're a new Christian, you play Russian roulette. Anybody ever done that with the Bible? You know, you say, speak to me, Lord. You, know, you just open the Bible wherever it is, and you close your eyes and you point. I used to do that when I was a, a new Christian. I don't, I don't do that Russian roulette thing anymore. But sometimes he'll tell you, just go to the Word, open it, and I'll show you where I want you to go. But lately, I hear it. I'll hear him say Psalm 33 or wherever, and I'll go get it. So I'll wait. And, and nothing. I'm not hearing anything. And then I hear him say, open that Bible in there. Big Bible we keep in there at the well. Big family Bible. He said, open it. I'm going to take you to where I want you to go. So I was so excited. And it was so special. I heard him say, now close your eyes. You know, like it's a, like it's a surprise. You close your eyes. got a surprise for you. Close your eyes. Well, I opened my eyes and said, oh, that was just me. That was just me. So I just go throw open the Bible. And it opens to like Isaiah chapter 8. And it makes no sense to me. I'm going, earth. And then I'm a little despondent. I think, I have missed God. I have missed God. No, God did speak, but you, you're going to see I was a little disobedient. And I said, I, you know, like a little whipped puppy, I walk, I come over here, and I just go sit back there where Megan it is. But then I got it out of the way, and I just start take off to praying. And then I feel just to get up and start walking. Well, when you walk, you might ever walk and pray. Is there anybody else that walks and prays sometimes? I love to walk and pray. So I'm just walking and I'm praying. Then I feel him say again, close your eyes. I do that sometimes. If you walk and pray, sometimes don't you close your eyes? You know, I walk. But then I'll open it every now and then to make sure I'm not going to hit a chair. Then I'll walk with my eyes closed a little more. If I feel like I've walked pretty far, then I'll, you know, I'll open my eyes again before I get to, to that wall. And But I felt him say, just keep walking. Don't open your eyes. And I knew what he was doing. He's doing what I testified to y'all out on that stage last night that I do with my classes when I teach the high school class upstairs at Super Summer. We do object lessons. We do things that you can see to illustrate the scripture. Well, y'all know what he was doing with me. We walk by faith and not by sight. So I'm up here and I, I feel him gently telling me, just walk, praise me, pray. Don't open your eyes. Yes, sir. So I just start walking. And I feel to go this way. And I'm just walking and praying. And the first little bit, I remember feeling this little bit of fear like, but I'm going to hit a chair or stumble or something. But no. I said, no, Father, I trust you. I trust you. I just kept walking. And I, I never opened my eyes. And I'm just, the interesting thing is, oh, people of God, when you start walking by faith and not by sight, your spiritual senses kick in. What is it? Spider-Man got the spidey sense or something? You've got a spiritual sense. If you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, I think everybody here this morning is, if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost, you've got senses. People that you don't even realize sometimes because the Holy Ghost is there. I could feel when I was uh, exactly where I was. It felt, I felt like Star Wars, you know, with Obi-Wan Kenobi saying, Luke, you know, here's the force, Luke. Put on that helmet so you can't see what you're doing, Luke. I understood now what Obi-Wan Kenobi was doing with Luke. Mm -hmm. Although that's farce. But so here I am, no offense to you Star Wars fans. So my eyes are closed and I knew exactly when to turn. I could feel. He didn't speak it to me, but I could feel, you know, turn left. And and I did. And when I got over here, I literally could feel the wall with my eyes closed. No, 
Now, just to let you know, I was not walking like this. <laughs> you know. Like, there it is. Oh, I was up not doing that. And I, but I, I literally felt to keep my hands very close to me so my hands didn't play a role in what I was doing. And when I got to that door, I could feel the door. I knew exactly where I was. I can't explain it. There was a sense, and maybe, maybe God gave that to us humanly, that I could feel the door. And I walked through, the, it was open, thankfully, and I walked through the door, and I knew exactly when to turn the corner. I had a slight moment of dismay when I thought, there's a stoop somewhere, okay? But it was okay. I knew exactly what to do. I never opened my eyes, and I went straight to the Bible. And I, I touched the Bible, and I felt such peace, and I knew. He told me the first time, close your eyes. I'm going to show you where to go in the Word. And I was like, no, that was just me. This time I obeyed, and I could feel him saying, I could feel him saying, we are going to be such a people in this last day. When things are dark, I'm not talking about just Charlottesville people. That's the tip of the iceberg. There's other things coming that we're going to have to walk so by faith and not by sight. And he's going to tell you sometimes, oh, okay, go to the left, go to the left. And you may not understand why you've got to go to the left, but if you're in the Spirit, you're going to tell you what to do and when I got to that word and I opened it and I and then it was I was free to open my eyes at that point that's exactly where I was it's where your Bible is right now first Kings 21 my first impulse was first Kings 21 Jezebel and, and they're licking up her blood the dog has prophesied that she's what and then I remembered I remembered now, what had I been over there in the well praying about before all this happened? I had been saying, God, show me, God, what, what makes, what's hindering Christians worldwide. Show me, God, what's hindering this town. Show me, God, what that final spider is. My mama had a dream years ago about Wanaco where she saw that we, the intercessors in Wanaco, because we've been at this a long time, and when she saw us swatting little spiders, here they come, we'd swat the little spiders. She said, but Leslie, God told me there's a big one. There's a big spider that keeps going and hiding in the corner. And, and we think we're doing a good thing killing all the little ones. It's not a bad thing. But she said, there's a big one. And she said, you're going to hide. I just remember that. She told me years ago, she said, you're going to know what it is. God's going to tell you. All these years I've been saying, God, what is it that's holding back the people of God? What's holding back? This town. This town's never had a church that preached the Holy Ghost. I told you this last week. I tell you pretty much every week. This town's never had a, a church that survived, that did that. You drive up to Kings, go to Stokes County, go straight on up the road, you're going to find about six. It's because there's just so many choices. Wanna Coast never had that. It has it now. We're surviving. We are going to not only survive, we're going to thrive. But the thing is, there's been something so powerful here that's held back the move of God. And that's what I was asking him. That was my night. I was saying, God, show me. I want to know what's hindering people. And when he gave me this, I have heard people preach for, uh, how long have I been in Pentecost? Since I was 19. That was a long time ago. I've heard people preach about a Jezebel spirit just on and on and on and on. It got to the point that I heard it preached in so many ways that I started rolling my eyes. You just want me to be blunt with you? I, I was cynical. I was like, yeah, okay, right. Because I heard it preached the wrong way. A lot of times it would be like a preacher would say, you married to a mouthy woman? It's a Jezebel spirit. You cast out that Jezebel spirit. A lot of times it was used against women. A Je the Jezebel spirit. You're dealing with something that is way beyond women. You're dealing with something that can affect anybody and any entity, whether male, whether female, even towns. It is something so strong because it's all about witchcraft. What is witchcraft? Control and manipulation. It's in the churches, people of God, religious spirits in churches that use control and manipulation. You're dealing with the spirit of Jezebel. I repented to God that I've not made fun of it. I didn't make fun of it. But I repented to God that I didn't take it seriously before. 1 Kings chapter 21. When God showed me what this was, I realized 
That was the first sermon I ever preached. You say, where was that, Leslie? Was that up to Tabernacle a few years back? Where was that? No. I always thought the first sermon I ever preached was at Forest Chapel United Methodist Church over near the Hillbilly Hideaway. I was 13, and it was Youth Sunday. And people were saying, well, I'm not going to get up in front of the church and talk. I'm not going to do it. Get Leslie. Everybody starts, but she'll do it. I know Leslie will do it. And I was like, well, nobody else will do it. I guess I'll do it. So I preached a sermon at 13 on Youth Sunday. They let, you know. Methodist, they let women do it anyway. So uh, then next year, same thing. You know, who's going to preach on you, Sunday? Not me. Get Leslie. So Leslie did it again. I always thought that was the first sermon I ever preached. God showed me Thursday night. It was not. The first sermon I ever preached was at First Baptist Church in about 1970. I took the pulpit in a church that did not allow women, but as, as a little girl, so they let me. They let me take the pulpit at First Baptist Church, and this is the scripture I read, 1 Kings chapter 21. And I remembered it suddenly. It came back. I said, I remember this, God. That's the first sermon I ever preached. It wasn't way over there at Blues Creek. Forest Chapel's got a Warner Cove address. No, it was smack down in the middle of Warner Cove. He put me up there at age about eight to preach that word, to prophesy what is happening right now? Can you see this? This chapter, 1 Kings chapter 21, prophesies what's going to happen to Jezebel. Says, okay, you think you're thriving right now, but guess what's going to happen? The day's going to happen that you are going to be where the dogs can lick your blood off the pavement. Jezebel is going down. I was able to prophesy that through the written word of God in about 1970 at First Baptist Church. I didn't remember any of this till then. And what I'm thinking at that point is, why on earth would I have been in First Baptist Church reading that scripture? I mean, that's a, you know, it is kind of a downer when you read that scripture. I remembered my Uncle Andrew. This was my mother's oldest brother. And I remembered he got me up there because it was, it was a special Sunday. And he was going to allow the Sunday school people to take part in it. And he chose mm -hmm. one person to speak the word. And he chose me. And it wasn't favoritism. I don't remember him ever showing me favoritism. He's a good man, but it wasn't favoritism. He felt to put me up there. So what do I do when all this is being revealed to me? One of the first things I started thinking is, I've got to talk to Uncle Andrew. I've got to call him. He lives up in Westfield. I've got to call him. The very next morning, I go to the party for the town manager, and who is the first person I see? Uncle Andrew. I don't see him very often. I go running to him. I say, Uncle Andrew, I've got to ask you something. When I was a little bitty girl, do you remember that you got me up in front of the church? He starts nodding. You, you remember that? Why did I? Do you remember the scripture I read? He said, refresh my memory. I said, 1 Kings 21. He starts nodding. He said, yeah, because they were going to let me preach that day. It was lay speaker day or something. They were going to let me preach. And he said, they let me preach. And I felt to get you up there to read the scripture. What's the chances of that? And I'm going to run into him. He's going to clarify it. I can't wait to talk to my mom and see her take on it to see what she remembers. But here's the thing, people of God. I've waited for this my whole life. We are taking this controlling, manipulative spirit that has hindered a move of God, not only in maybe some of our lives, but in this town. We're taking it down. Why? Because we have the authority. He's called us to do this for such a time as this. It's not just in this town. It's nationwide. You've got a controlling, manipulative, serpentine kind of spirit roaming through this land right now. I want somebody to start. Chelsea, I don't know. I feel you. Can you start at, at verse 1? Read us a little bit of 1 Kings. Hallelujah. Chapter 21. And it came to pass that after these things that the king that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house. And I will give thee for it a better vineyard than it, or if it seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said, said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. Stop right there just a minute. 
let's look at the principal characters of this. You've got the first person introduced, Naboth. That's what we call him, because that's what it looks like in Hebrew. It's like Naboth. Naboth, Naboth, we'll say for English sake, had a vineyard. Now, I'm going to tell, tell you how that relates to you. You yourself are a vineyard, because that word in Hebrew means garden, a beautiful, fruitful garden. His name, Naboth, literally means fruit or produce that springs forth from the ground. Springing up is what it means. So when you've got this man, a good, a good Israelite, who's got this garden, who's got this vineyard, who gave it to him? His fathers. It came down through his ancestors. So this was his father's vineyard, passed down to him. It was fruitful. I believe that. You know why I believe that? Because Ahab wouldn't have wanted it. Oh, I see something new I never saw on that. The enemy wouldn't be coming after you if you weren't destined to bear great fruit. He'd never be coming after you. He wouldn't even worry about you. Why would he waste his time on you unless you were destined to bear great fruit like this vineyard of Naboth? Ahab wanted it. You know why Ahab wanted it? Oh, God. Because Ahab was a worshiper of Baal now. Oh, he's, he's still proclaimed, you know, the one God of Israel. Israel was split at this time. You had the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah. He was the king of Israel. So he was not in Jerusalem. He was somewhere near Samaria at that point, Jezreel. So there he is in Jezreel, but he's married, a heathen princess. He joined, you see that? He joined himself to some unholy things. You see something, say it. He said worship her and fail and a lot of the things that we talked about Friday night, he said it. I just thought it was funny that we didn't let the worshipers arise. Goes right, a perfect, counter, polar opposite, counter. About, you know, those who worship him in truth and spirit, basically, that whole song is about the real worshipers, the real people of God yes. standing up. Father, I see that you are drawing a line in the sand. There's a line in the sand that's being drawn more and more clearly in this last day. Christians are going to stand out more than ever and be more separated from the world. I'm not talking about just in the way you look or whatever. I'm talking about people are going to know you're standing separate. That's what Naboth, huh? That's what Naboth did. He stood separate, and when Ahab came to him and wanted that garden, because Ahab was a worshiper of Baal now, because he had married the heathen princess, and he knew Naboth's garden was bearing good fruit, and he's like, I want it. I want it. And what he says in the scripture says, I want it for a garden of herbs. I want it for virtually a vegetable garden. But when I did research on that, it proved to me clearly he wanted it as a place to worship Baal because they would take herbs and different things to, to worship Baal. You know, even today in witchcraft, they take herbs and do things with it. I have this friend, and he, we have a mutual friend, and he said, she's a witch, plain and simple. He said, you should walk into her pantry. She's got all these herbs, and she can tell you, you know, if you mix this one with this one, this is what it'll do to somebody. This is the curse it'll put on somebody. People work this stuff even now. It dates way back. It's ancient. So there's Naboth with a beautiful, fruitful vineyard. That's a good thing from his father, just like the Garden of Eden. People of God, we were put in a garden destined to be stewards of a beautiful garden. That was the first ever vineyard, so to speak, was the Garden of Eden. And the father gave it to us, just like the father gave it to Naboth, just like even now. We're supposed to be out of the Father's vineyard working. That's our destiny even now. So here we are, and Ahab wants it. So he goes to him and says, I'll pay you for it. I'll give you. Did you get that far? Did we read that far? You did? He said, I want it. I'll even pay you for it. And Naboth said, no, I, I can't I give it up. A bit better vineyard. Yeah, I'll give you something better. People of God, there is a seducing spirit in the land. The spirit of Jezebel, we can call it. There's, there's other names, I believe, of these different spirits in the land seducing the people of God. I can give you this. It'd be better. If you give up this, I'll give you something better. I promise you, I'll pay you. I'll pay you something. Or I'll give you something comparable to it, but it's going to be better. We've got to know. We've got to know our Father's voice. We prayed that the other night. Shannon and I were praying. We were having a good prayer session. We were praying. And I remember you called that. Did you call that out? I think she did. She called out. And we've got to hear the Father's voice. 
and a stranger's voice, we're not going to follow. We have to make sure we are free from any of these controlling, manipulative spirits that are roaming the land, that have been here in Walnut Cove especially, we have to make sure we're free so we can set other people free and so we're not seduced by another voice that's calling out to us. Naboth stood firm. So firm that then, let's see the next part of what Ahab did. Where did we get to, Chels? Uh, that was verse, the end of verse 3. Yeah, 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 let's hear it. Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel his wife came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel his wife said unto him, Dost thou not now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise, and eat bread, and let thy heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. Stop right there. That's the next part of the story. You see how this is going. He's pouting. That's exactly what he's doing. Now, he's in Jezreel right now. And Jezreel was a place, actually in Hebrew it means God has sown, God has planted. Because it was such a lush and luxurious part of Israel at that time. It was a garden spot. So he already lived in a garden spot, but he wanted more. You know, that's what the, that's what the spirit of Jezebel wants. Oh, I got this. I got to gobble up more. Can you see how that's worked in this town? Can you see how it's worked even with buildings and land in our town? Oh, I got this, but let me go get some more. Oh, I got this, but let me go get some more. And let me hang on to it. It's the spirit people that's worked all through this land and going down to the microcosm of this little town. So Ahab hears the man of God, Naboth, stand up and say, No, you're not having my father's vineyard. So Ahab goes back to his palace, gets on his bed, and he's literally sulking. If you read other versions, it, it, he was sullen. It says, you know, turned his, I've done that. If you've not done that, surely you have. Turned his face to the wall. And, well, here comes Jezebel. You know, she's the heathen princess. According to what Megan found in her research, I think it was Megan, Ahab was the first king of Israel to align himself with the heathen princess. Am I, is that what it said? That's what one of the study Bible said, but I did not research it. We didn't research it. Sure. We don't know for sure, but that's what a study Bible said, that, that he was the first one to align himself with paganism by marrying Jezebel. And Jezebel had already been known in Israel. When you get to 1 Kings 21, she was already known back in the other chapters. Remember what she did. She said, I'm killing all the prophets of God. Because what does the spirit of Jezebel want to do? Take your voice. The spirit of Jezebel wants to literally steal your voice. She hated people who spoke the word of God. And she tries to steal their voice. She even put the word out on Elijah. After Elijah had the battle up on Mount Carmel, and she put the word out. She said, kill him. Kill him. Of course, he killed the prophets of Baal. She was ticked off. But she's like, kill him. She came against anything that would speak the word of God in truth. That same spirit is Roman. Now, I'm not saying any of this to scare you, especially the, the kids. I'm not saying anything to scare you. I'm telling you, we're going to deal with this. We're going to be a town and a people who are free of that. We're not going to have it on us. I'm not going to have it. Oh, God, I'm not going to have it. Now, when you're talking about her coming to him, I want you to notice how the enemy whispers to you. I can imagine that she is all sweet at first, you know. Well, what's wrong with you that you're not even eating? You know, the whole bless your heart thing we talk about all that. Well, bless your heart, you're not even eating. What's wrong that you're not taking bread? Well, I wanted that vineyard, and, and he won't give it to me. I even offered him something better, and he won't give it to me. She turns. Do you see how she turns? She begins to mock him. I studied lots of different versions of this. She begins to mock him. She said, you're, is this how you act? You are king of Israel. And this is what you do. She turns and mocks him. When I was studying different, uh, different resources about people who dealt with what I believe is a genuine Jezebel spirit, they said it usually goes in tandem, hand in hand with a mocking spirit. 
you said it the other night, some of you kids when we were talking about it, but, but I read it online last night. It goes hand in hand with the mocking spirit. Things that mock are not of God. Now, you can, uh, we joke, you know, we, everybody, I think, pretty much, we have fun, we laugh, we joke, but sometimes you can hear a mocking tone in somebody's voice. That's never of God. What was it you said one time, Megan, about aligning yourself? What'd you say? God was dealing with me about not mocking because it's a demonic strategy, and he said not to be in league with demons. Don't be in league with demons. Mocking. A mocking spirit. Jezebel, you can see it going on right here with her. So what did she say? She said, I'll handle this. She took control. She said, I'll handle this. How did she handle it? Chelsea, read on. If you would, please. And let's see how she did it. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name sealed them with his seal and sent the letters unto the elders and to the nobles that were in his city dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letter saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people and set two men, sons of Belial, before him to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out and stone him that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. Keep going a little bit more. And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money. For Naboth is not alive but dead. And it came to pass when Ahab Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession. <laughs> okay, stop right there. So now you see what happens in the next course of this story. <coughs> she sets up this intricate plot to kill Naboth. If I can't get his vineyard, if my husband wants it and we can't get it, I'll just kill him. I'll get him out of the way. So what did she do? She lied on him. She got witnesses to rise up and speak lies and say, number one, he's blasphemed God. Number two, he's blasphemed the king. He's spoken against God and the king, and for that reason, he deserves to die. And that's exactly what happened. They stoned him. They took him out and stoned him according to the lie, according to the lies that they were told, and the law said this is what you do. I'm telling you right now, we're turning this story around. Oh, God, because Jesus redeemed everything. We're taking this very story, and I want you to see yourselves, people of God, as a fruitful vineyard. Now, you say, well, I'm not really coming against anything right now. Everything in my life is going okay. I'm, I'm good. Satan is out to get you. Now, that is not some doomsday prophecy I'm putting on you. That is not some... Uh, thing that you should, you know, be scared of. And I'm telling you, it's just a logical thing. He's out to get you if you are a person of God. If you are destined, and you are, to be a fruitful vineyard, he's out to get you. He's going to use lies to do it. Seducing spirits, lies to come against you. Two ways she lied on him right there. Told lies about God. That's one of the ways that the spirit of Jezebel tries to get us. Makes us think bad things about God. Well, why did this happen? How could this happen to me? How could God have let this happen to me? You don't know how many people have left the faith. because I've talked to some just in the past week who left the faith because bad things happened. And they said, how could this happen? How could a loving God have let this happen? That, that's a lie on God. Another thing is... They're, they're lying to you about God. They're making you feel worthless. These seducing spirits are making you think you're worthless. What will you ever do? You, what can, I know what you did a long time ago. I know what you did yesterday.
day that maybe you shouldn't have done. So what makes you think you can work for God? What makes you think you're ever going to be able to be anything for God? You see what they're doing? They're lying against the character of God to turn the people of God the wrong way. To make the people of God never produce the fruit. Do you know how many Christians die and never produce the fruit they're supposed to produce? Maybe they go on to heaven, but they didn't forever produce the fruit they were supposed to because there was a Jezebel spirit seducing them, telling them lies about, about God's nature and about themselves. The second way, the second way that Naboth was come against was a lie. Why oh, is speaking against the king? He's speaking against the king. The devil will come into your life and speak things to you about people, lies about people. Not just about God, but about people. Well, she doesn't like me. I can tell. Something about Michelle. When she comes around me, I don't know. I just feel like this is not true. I'm making all this up. We love each other. But you know what I'm saying? He'll make you think things that are lies and deceit. They're not true. I have fallen, anybody else, I have fallen victim to this. Thank you. Two of us, three, a few more. I have fallen victim to this where I literally listened to a lie of the devil about somebody. And I had to go back and repent. I had to go back and repent this last week about a woman that years ago, I didn't even know her, but I'd heard some things about her, and I believed falsely about her. She doesn't live in this town. I had believed falsely about her. That woman doesn't know that I believed falsely about her, but guess what? She's, we've become friends now. I know her now. We've become friends, and she is so kind to me. She's helping me. She's blessing my life, and I realized I believed a lie about that woman. Oh, God. Demons want to come and whisper lies to you against God and against people. But they don't love you. I can tell they don't love you. Well, they haven't liked your Facebook post all week. They don't <laughs> like you anymore. I can tell it. I thought I literally thought that. Isn't that silly? Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Okay, Michelle, me and Michelle. <laughs> It's a Jezebel spirit. It's a seducing, seductive thing sweeping through the realms of Christianity to turn Christians one against each other and, and to turn Christians against God and to turn Christians against themselves to think they're not worthy. That's exactly what happened. Raise up these witnesses to come against Naboth and to say all these things to the point that he dies and his vineyard is stolen. Oh, God, his vineyard is stolen by Ahab and Jezebel. I'm going to tell you right now, the devil has stolen the vineyards and the fruitfulness of God's people too long. I'm not putting up with it anymore. I know for a fact that I wish I could remember the date. Wouldn't it be cool if it was like today or something in 1970? I don't know when it was. No clue. First Baptist Church. God knew my destiny. He knew I was going to be called to Walnut Cove to tear down the strongholds that the Spirit of God, can, there could be a church and churches, not just, I want it everywhere. I want First Baptist to be preaching the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. I want them all to be preaching it. I want the gifts of the Spirit to be flowing everywhere. I'm not selfish, are you? Don't we want it everywhere? He knew, God knew, duh, that I was going to be standing right here today. And he had me stand in a pulpit in this town. The biggest church in town, the highest point in this town is that church right there. And he had me proclaim this word that day. And you know what he had me proclaim? This next part that she's going to read. The final part that she's going to read. Let's hear it, Chelsea. What hits me first, what hits Say me it. about this is, to Ooh. me, this is like the best example of the enemy coming to steal, kill, and destroy. Yes. Jesus came to give life and life more, more abundantly. But that passage where in John where he talks about that is the same passage where he talks about my sheep know my voice. It is the same, the isn't same it? same passage. So I think that's just really cool. That's totally cool. Oh, thank you for your word, God. Pick it up. What verse are we going verse to? Verse 17. 17, the word. Elijah comes in. Elijah, get ready. <laughs> and the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, with whither he has gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? 
and thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick thy blood, even thy Keep going. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up and left in Israel, and will make thy house like the house of Jeroboam, yeah. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I'll the house of Basha. Basha, the son of Ahijah. I don't know. For the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. One more verse. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dog shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. And it says in another another book of the Bible they're going to lick her blood up. Prophecy came right there of what's happening to Jezebel. Right there. Elijah, not this one, Elijah the Tishbite came and spoke the word of the Lord and said, because of what you've done, oh, because you stole the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, you're going to pay for this. You're going to die. Your wife. Jezebel, the dogs are going to eat her. They're literally going to just later lick her blood, it says in another version. It's been prophesied the downfall of these demonic spirits that have come against the people of God, that have maybe come against you. And I'm not just talking about in the last days and at the final end where they're cast into the lake of fire. I'm not just talking about that. We have authority over this right now. The Father who gave us that vineyard and that inheritance and told us we were going to be a fruitful vine. You know, it says He's the vine. We're the branches. We're going to bear much fruit in Him. Jesus is that vine and that vineyard who came that we could sprout out like branches off Him. Through Him, we take down Jezebel. He's the Redeemer. It was prophesied. Who took down Jezebel? Well, first of all, the one who prophesied it, spoke it, by the word of God, you speak these things, and it was coming to pass, was Elijah. What does his name mean in Hebrew? Eli Yah. Eli means my God. Yah, you're saying my God is God. You're not saying, in Hebrew, you're not saying my God is Adonai. My God is El Shaddai. These are all good names. I love them. You're not saying that. You're saying his real name that Jews don't even remember how to pronounce anymore. We, we give it four letters. We call it the Tetragrammaton. We say it's Y-H-V-H. Like y -H -V -H. Yah. It's a four letters. Tetragrammaton. Like Yahweh. And people argue it's Jehovah. Well, no, there was no J in Hebrew. It's not Jehovah. Yahweh. Well, Y-H-V-H. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'm asking God to tell me. I'm asking him, what was the real name? Why has it been lost? Nonetheless, the name Elijah, Eliyah, is saying, that's who my God is. That's who my God is. We're not talking about all the other names for God. We're talking about that name, the most powerful name, Eliyah. You said, my God is God. And that's who came and prophesied. Ha! That's who came and prophesied the end of Jezebel because that's the only one that can do it. That one, the almighty God, that's who can do it. Now, did he kill her? No, he's not the one that did it. Later, she lived beyond Elijah. Elijah was already gone when Jezebel died. Elisha was on the scene. Oh, there's something in that I just felt. Elisha was on the scene. And all of a sudden, there was a new king anointed. His name was Yehu. Oh, God. I got his name written down right here because it, it, it just really hit me. The name, we call it Je Jehu, but it's actually pronounced Yah Yahu. It takes Elijah's name and turns it around backwards and says, the Tetragrammaton, Yahweh, Jehovah will say, is he. My God is Jehovah, is Elijah. Then you turn it around and say, Jehovah is my God. He's the one who came and was riding through the city. And Jezebel sees him and she's like, oh, there's the new king. Oh, 
And she goes and gets her makeup mirror or whatever. It literally says in the Bible that she painted up her face. I'm thinking of that Kenny Rogers song. You painted up your lips and rolled and curled your tinted hair. You know, who knew you'd hear Kenny Rogers here this morning? But here she is. I'm thinking, and there she is. She's fixing her face. And it says she did these elaborate things to her hair. And she goes and looks out the window. Why? Because the Jezebel spirit always wants to seduce and win you over. Make you believe things that aren't true. It will doom you in the end. And Jehu was riding through, and all of a sudden he sees her, and he calls out. He said, who is on my side? Who is on my side that will say, God is God? Yah, Yahweh is God. Who's on my side? And there were some of her eunuchs came to the window, and they were obviously on the side of God, and they pushed her out of the window, and that's when she fell. And Yahoo, Yahoo, his horses ran over her body to the point that when they found her, there was nothing left but a skull, her feet, and the palms of her hands. Isn't that interesting? I don't. Know, there's probably revelation in that. If you get it, let me know later. Whenever skull, feet, and the palms of her hands is all that was left, and the dogs lapped her blood. Jezebel was done for. She was gone, just as prophesied. Now, people of God, here we go. Megan, come on up. Whatever you feel to play. We are fruitful vineyards. I'm claiming it for myself. I am not going to be hindered any longer by any kind of controlling, manipulative, seducing spirit. I'm not going to be hindered by that anymore. I'm asking you to join with me today and say, neither are you. Neither are you. I was reading something. Are they here? Tell them go on because I'm, I'm driving myself. Let me read something to you as Megan starts to play. Jennifer, Le Le Jennifer LeClaire is a... I guess you'd call her a prophetess in the land. She writes a lot for Charisma magazine. Here's what she said. If you are doing anything at all for God, and especially if you have a prophetic mandate on your life, Jezebel wants to cut off your voice. If Jezebel can't cut off your voice, she'll try to pervert your voice by seducing you to defile yourself. So if she can't stop you from cut off your voice, she's going to try to seduce you to do something that will defile your walk with God to such a point that your voice will be meaningless after that until, you're, until you repent and turn. How do you get rid of Jezebel? You've got to first know that my God is God. The very Eliyah who was on Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal were there. And he basically said, why do you halt between two opinions? If God is God, let him be God. If Baal is God, let him be God. Why do you halt? between? Why are you going back and forth between two opinions? Who is the real God? We know he proved it on, he proved it on Mount Carmel. And the prophets of Baal, they slew them there by the brook. My God is God. You got to know the mighty power of the God that you serve and that it's His will that you be free. That I be free. That this town be free. I believe with my whole heart that I know what the big spider is now. It even goes in hand in hand with religious spirits. What keeps the move of God out of this town? Religious spirits have tried to. Nothing's going to anymore. But religious spirits, they don't want it. They're speaking lies to you. That stuff's of the devil. That's a cult. I don't know. All that speaking in tongues, all that stuff. I don't think you need to do all that. That ended. I believe the Bible says that ended. The Bible didn't say it ended. But seduce whole seducing spirits are whispering to the church world. We're not having it here anymore. I'm going to tell you what. We're putting this to flight. Now, I don't know if there's more we got to do in our personal lives or, or for the town. You know, the Bible says that this kind goes out but by prayer and fasting. Powerful demonic forces, prayer and fasting. I'm willing to go on a fast with you. I, I, I've told you that for the last few years, we need to be fasting regularly. I actually spent a year and three months. We're supposed to be fasting regularly. I'm not asking who is and who's not. That's your personal business. You don't have to go broadcast it. That's between you and God. But I'm asking you, join me in fasting. It's a good rule of thumb to try to take one day a week at least for some kind of fast. Skip a meal, skip a whole day of meals. And then periodically longer fast if you can. It's hard work in a job. I know it is. But maybe you could just skip a meal. God 
sees your heart in that. That's how we get rid of Jezebel. And we're casting her down. We know that Eliyah, my God is God. We know that Jehu, Yahu, we know that he's saying, yes, he is God. Yahweh is God. Powerful God. I think. Say it. We have to also know that we, we have no need to fear the enemy and to fear the Jezebel spirit. Because we, I mean, not only do we have the power to get rid of it, but if we are... With, if we are in right standing with God, there is no reason to fear the Jezebel spirit. Because I think sometimes, you know, we believe in God and believe that God will deliver us from situations. But we need to start learning not to fear the situations. Because I feel like sometimes we think, oh, the devil's coming against me. And sometimes we might have a twinge of fear in that. But I, I think one thing is that I heard a past, I don't remember which one, but... Sometimes I watch pastor, uh, you know, sermon videos or stuff. And I remember one sermon where one of the pastors said, you know, said, if I'm not getting it, if I haven't noticed I'm getting it, I've gotten attacked very much in a while, I start to say, what am I not doing? What am I not doing? He said, because I want to be the number one person on the devil's hit list. He says, but it, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I, I necessarily want the devil to attack me. But he's saying, you know, when I see the devil trying, the key word trying to come against me. He said, I know I'm doing something right, and I rejoice in that. Because he says, the devil can try to attack me all he wants, but he won't you know, succeed. He won't beat me. He won't even be able to affect me. And so I think that's the key is, you know, not to fear the devil and to, you know, if, we're, if you're getting attacked, don't be afraid. Just be confident in the fact that, hey, I'm doing something right, and if the devil does attack me, then God's got me. I'm fine, you know. Yes. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Oh, God. Speak a word over us before you go. I know you just spoke a word, but I'm saying, pray. Are they here? Is no. They here? Yeah, come on. He, he stayed behind, so he didn't have to leave early. Pray over us, Elijah. It is interesting his name is Eliyah. I think he was born for such a time as this to help deal with a Jezebel spirit. You think it's an accident my mama can't talk and that doctors keep trying to diagnose it? You, I think something attacked my mama to take her voice. We're not having it. Right now, God, we just come before you. We thank you for the things that you have brought forth, for the words that have been spoken, the songs that have been sung. We thank you for, for your words and your truth. Right now, God, we pray here together in unity that you would... Build us up, God, that you would draw us so close to you that we would know the sound of your voice, God, that we would not be so far away as to not be able to know the difference between your voice and the voice of the enemy, God, but that as we draw closer and closer to you and you draw yourself closer to us, that we would know your voice, that we would be able to use the Spirit to divide and discern your voice from the voice of a Jezebel spirit, the voice of the enemy God. And we pray that we would be able to stand up in strength and not fear, because we know that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, God. So we pray right now that we would be able to stand up against, yes, up against the Jezebel oh, spirit, that we would not be you. persuaded, not oh, be, God. that we would not be manipulated or deceived no. or caught in the lines no. of the Jezebel no. spirit. But we pray that you would help us to rise up, we'll rise up. against this Jezebel Thank spirit. You. And that uh, and that we declare victory, victory over any Jezebel spirit that has already come against us or it may already be in our lives or in our family members' lives right now. We declare victory over you, Jezebel spirit, right now in Jesus' name. The blood oh. of Jesus covers each and every one of us. The blood of Jesus that he spilled when he died on the cross for us, that by the blood we are free from anything that would come against us, especially a Jezebel spirit. So I know I pray today that when we leave, when we go out of this building, that we would leave infused with the power of God and the love of God. And that when we leave this building, no matter where we go, no matter who we are around, we will be aware, alert, anticipating and that we will be we will be standing strong with the full armor of God yes, to yes, defend yes. ourselves from any spirit and that we will overcome each and every obstacle.
We just praise you and thank you for bringing that victory to us. We're not done. We're not done. If you've you got to go, that's fine. Anytime, I'm not offended. If you have to go, but we're not done. I really strongly felt when he was saying that, that almost all of us have been the victim of a Jezebel spirit, even in a church situation before. Controlling, manipulative churches that try to hang on to you and, oh, don't you dare go visit so-and-so's revival because it, you know, they might teach you something wrong and don't you... Controlling, manipulative, religious spirits. I believe I have come up under them all my life in many different churches. Break that off your life. You have the authority to break that off your life. Her name, we say Jezebel, her name was Isephel. I say, I'm saying the real name when I pray about her. Isephel. That last part of it is the word for Baal. It meant she was like a wife to Baal. Baal was her husband. Have you joined yourself at times with organizations even, churches even, that, that there's a controlling, manipulative spirit there? I don't ever want to hear. We, I'm praying against it. No, we will never have. We don't allow any sort of a Jezebel spirit here. Never. No control, manipulation, none here. God, convict me. I ask you right now. I'm transparent before you, God, by the Holy Ghost. Lord, convict me. If you see me doing that, when you see me doing that, Lord, convict me that I may repent and say, no, we're not having that here. We're not having that here. The Jezebel spirit, Isephel, is not allowed in the well. The well is not for sale. Isephel is not allowed here. And I command right now that any of, of those seductive lying works that have tried to be worked in this well, I serve notice on you now. Go. Go out of the portals of this city and we close the gate against you. Hard of a shake in the email portal and you're not coming back. These people of God are fruitful vineyards. Fruitful vineyards in Christ. In Jesus. In Yeshua. Fruitful vineyards with no hindrance. Right now, I break every religious spirit off me that came from every church I ever went to. If whatever religious spirits were at First Baptist Church, Forest Chapel, Methodist Church, Christ Temple, Apostolic Church, the Tabernacle of Praise. If anything's been here in the well, I break that off me right now in the name of Jesus by the authority. By the authority. Because my God is God. My God is God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Break them off yourself. I break off every religious spirit from everybody in this place in the name of Yahshua. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Oh, the irony of it, the irony of it. You know how many, do you know how many male preachers have called out Jezebel spirits and sometimes used it as a, as a form of control themselves? To keep, even to keep women down before. It's like God is showing me that right now. That women have been kept down before because males will say, well, if she tries to do too much in the church, she must have a Jezebel spirit. I got to call that out. Even using the Jezebel spirit itself as a controlling manipulative spirit. I asked God the other night, I said, why did you, that seems ironic, I'm a woman and you're telling me about the Jezebel spirit here? And he showed me clearly what we've already said. It's not a female spirit. It's a spirit that affects males and females alike. There's no gender here. It just happens to be that it came, it operated through the Jezebel in the Bible first and foremost that we saw. It t it'll take any victim it can, male or female. And, and I think one of my kids had said the other, other night, what, what more interesting way to deal with Jezebel by actually having a woman call it out rather than have it called out against women. We're not having it here. I'm looking at every single one of you as we're closing down here today or we'll stay long as the Holy Ghost tells us to. We're not having it here. I know what it is now. In April... 
I knelt down right there and God told me what we've known for years, witchcraft in this town, control and manipulation, witchcraft has been worked and it's been worked against us. And I, I called that out. I broke that off me and I, I realized I had at times operated in witchcraft. You want to know how I did and how you may have too? Because we don't want to do it ever again. Did you ever pout? When somebody was, did you wrong? Did you ever be like, I'll show them. I just get my car. I just drive off. I make them feel bad. I make them feel bad because they hurt my feelings. We had, I had a fight with my husband, and he made me feel bad. I'll just show him. I won't answer his phone call when he calls me tonight when he's driving to work. I just won't do it. Won't he feel bad? He'll see me. From, he'll see what jewel he lost, you know, when when he doesn't. When I just don't even answer the phone, he'll miss me. He'll go to work. Witchcraft, I'm, I'm calling it out right now. It's witchcraft. When you try to control people, even by doing things like that, you try to manipulate them. I'm trying to manipulate you to treat me differently by doing this. It's witchcraft, control, and manipulation. I bet you almost everybody in this room has done that very thing that I just said to a friend or somebody. Well, I'll show them they hurt me. Watch. I control them. I'll make them come back to me and want me more because of how they treated me and I go away. You're manipulating. Stop it. Stop it. Quit pulling those strings. It's demonic. I repented. I sat in that floor right there and I repented. April, right before the girls went to the prom. I repented. I broke that off my life. I broke it as much as I knew that I could off this town. But I didn't have a name. I didn't have a name. Sometimes you got to call the devil for what it is. You got to call it. Now, I don't like to talk about prayer and fasting that personally. But in this case, I feel to tell you that when he revealed to me the other night what we've talked about this morning, I was at the end of a fast. I had gone on a fast and I was already to that point that everything was like, ooh, lovely. Like, you know, you get to a point in a fast after you've gone so long without food that somebody can point a loaded gun at you. You say, I love you, brother. Man, I love you. That's a pretty gun. You know, you just get, <laughs> you get to that point at the end of a fast that everything's floating and beautiful. You get to that point because you have to come to an humble place before you hear God. So this Jezebel spirit was revealed by prayer and fasting. We may, we're going to have to do some more of it. My mama's coming free. My mama's never going to have another attack at this. No more. If you've been attacked, we're not going to have it anymore. I'm standing with you, whoever you are. I'm standing with you. If you've come under an attack from this, we're not having it anymore. We're not having it in this town. If I have to come in here constantly as a gatekeeper of this town and saying Jezebel spirit is not welcome here, religious spirits, you're not hindering the move of God in Walnut Cove anymore. Call it out people of God. Not going to hinder a move of God anymore. No, we're not going to be like Winston-Salem or King. They got moves of God going on and that's wonderful and they're all right. We're going to be like Walnut Cove. Whatever God wants to do here, that's who we're going to be like. What God wants to do in Walnut Cove. I'm asking you, we in these seven weeks of preparation, where are we about what we've gone through a couple of weeks of this preparation? Well, we talked about that a few weeks ago. When the time of preparation, God told us to take seven full weeks. When does it end? September 23rd. The very day we're having Stoke Stoke now. we got seven weeks we had it first. Now we're down to maybe five. That's it, right there. Close it out with that. This song is what we're going to do. People of God, we, we're on it. The big spider. The big spider. We've been, clit, we've been killing these little ones all over the place. The big spider. Call it by name. Isephel. Oh, Isephel is not going to hinder you anymore. Nobody. Big squish. Big squish. That's exactly right. And if you feel you want private prayer over this, there's people that may need private prayer over this. Let's do it. Let's come together and do it. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Oh, God. I see some people there. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, 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 Jesus. If my 
Seek your face. 
right now. Thank you, God. Thank you for this fruitful people, fruitful vineyard. I'm putting a mark on the door right now. I'm putting a mark on that door. And we're declaring right now as a church family, <coughs> as seatbelt is not welcome here, not welcome here. Not going to affect anybody here. If so, if she tries, he tries, it tries, let's say it. If it tries, we can, we're going to cast it out. Gone. Put the mark on that door right there. Oh, God. Share what you feel before you go. Stay and pray as long as you want. 